What is up, people? Welcome back. You made it. This is the Unit 6 review, which means you're almost done with macro. So let's make sure you go out with a great grade. And to start off right, do me a favor and make sure to smash that like button and subscribe while the music plays. Hey, before we start, click the link in the description to get notes to follow along with this video. Okay, so this unit is where we finally admit that there's more than one country on Earth. Before this, we've often pretended that we were in a closed economy that didn't engage in trade with anybody outside of their own economy. This unit, though, is about open economies, where international trade and financial investment occur. Let's go ahead and start with balance of payments accounts. Balance of payments accounts are just a way to summarize transactions between people from different countries. It's just an accounting thing. Within the balance of payments, there are two accounts, the current account and the capital and financial account. The current account includes transactions that do not create a liability and includes three specific types of transactions, imports, exports, international transfers, and factor income. So whenever anything happens that affects any of those types of transactions, it's reflected in the current account by either adding to it or subtracting from it. When more money is going out than coming in, the current account is in deficit. On the other hand, when more money is coming in than going out, the current account is in surplus. So a country's current account balance increases as a result of an increase in net exports, an increase in international transfers coming into the country, or an increase in rent, wages, interest, or profits earned abroad. On the other hand, a country's current account balance will decrease if there's a decrease in net exports, an increase in international transfers going out of the country, or an increase in rent, wages, interest, or profits paid to people in other countries. Within the current account, there's also the trade balance, which is the difference between exports and imports. When net exports are positive, there's a trade balance surplus, and when net exports are negative, there's a trade balance deficit. Okay, then there's the capital and financial account, which records international transactions that create a liability and include transactions involving financial assets, such as stocks, bonds, currency, and ownership of companies. These transactions can be conducted either by governments and central banks or by private citizens. When financial inflows are greater than outflows, the capital and financial account is in a surplus. And when financial outflows are greater than inflows, it's in a deficit. The balance of payments includes both the CA current account and the CFA. And guess what? While each of them individually can be in surplus or deficit, taken together, they'll always be balanced. In other words, CA plus CFA equals zero or we can say that CA equals the opposite of or negative CFA. Okay, so now we're gonna to transition to the foreign exchange market and exchange rates. The foreign exchange market is a global electronic market in which currencies are traded for each other. The exchange rate is the price of one currency in terms of the other currency. Thankfully, we just focus on two currencies at a time. Let's say it's euros and dollars. The exchange rate is the idea of how many euros does it take to buy one dollar? Or we could say, how many dollars does it take to buy one euro? The price of dollars is expressed as euros over dollars, while the price of euros is expressed as dollars over euros. Let's say that we know that one US dollar is equal to 1.5 euros. So we wanna know how many dollars does it take to get one euro? Well, the euro price of the dollar is dollars over euros, so it's one over 1 1.5, which equals 67 cents. The beautiful thing about exchange rates is that you're really just finding the reciprocal. That's all there really is to it. A slightly more advanced version of a question could be to give you an exchange rate and then ask you how much something that costs $30 would cost in the other currency. So if the exchange rate is the same, something that costs $30 would be 30 times 1.5, which equals 45 euros. If it asks how much something that costs 30 euros would cost in dollars, we would do 30 divided by 1.5, which equals $20. And appreciation is when one currency increases in value relative to the other. Our original exchange rate was $1 for 1 1.5 euros. If it changes to $1 for 2 euros, the dollar has appreciated because $1 now buys more euros than it did before. And this necessarily means that the euro has depreciated relative to the dollar, which is to say that it has decreased relative to the other currency. And we can calculate the new exchange rate to prove this. 1 divided by 2 equals 50 cents. Previously, the euro was worth 67 cents, so it has become less valuable. One euro now buys fewer dollars than it bought before. All right, so now it's time to graph our foreign exchange market or FEM. And hey, this is the last new model of macro, so you've almost made it. 
Okay, on the left is the market for the US dollar and on the right is the market for the euro. As always, the vertical axis is the price, which in this market is the exchange rate. And we're gonna be specific to show the exchange rate for each. On the market for the dollar, the price of a dollar is expressed as euros per dollars. And on the euro market, euros are priced as dollars per euros. A little trick is that whatever currency your model is for is labeled on the bottom of the model on the x-axis. And it's also the bottom of your ratio that you make on the y-axis. Okay, next, here are the curves. And it's just another supply and demand model. As usual, sellers like higher prices and buyers like lower prices. My next couple of sentences really unlock basically everything you need to know about this model, so listen up. The important thing to know is, why do people supply and demand a currency? People demand a currency so that they can buy goods, services, or financial assets from another country. The key assumption of the foreign exchange market is that goods, services, and financial assets must be paid for in the currency of the country from which they originate. At some point after you buy your Audi, the dollars you use to buy it are going to be converted to euros because businesses want to be paid with the currency of the country that they're in. So back to demand, I'll say it again. People demand a currency so they can buy goods, services, or financial assets from another country. People supply a currency so they can buy a foreign currency. Let's say that Americans want to buy a bunch of Audis. To buy Audis, dollars have to be converted to euros. The American supplies some of her dollars to the foreign exchange market because she's demanding euros. We could say that she's selling dollars and buying euros on the foreign exchange market. So we demand foreign currency to buy stuff from that country, and we supply our domestic currency when we demand a foreign currency. That's basically it. It's not too bad, right? All right, so next up, we have to talk about what will shift our curves. And I have good news for you, but you may need to sit down for this. The same things that shift the demand curve shift the supply curve. The reason is because everything we do in this section has two currencies involved. And so each change will cause people from one country to buy more stuff from the other country, meaning that they'll demand more of that country's currency. And at the same time, in order to be able to buy the foreign currency, they'll need to supply their own domestic currency on the foreign exchange market. This means that the supply will always shift for one currency while the demand shifts for the other. Now, since this is a review video, I'm gonna go through our various shifters pretty quickly. But when you're taking a test or trying to figure out one of these questions, I don't want you trying to rely on a memorized list of shifters. I want you to consider the scenario and then decide, will this cause Americans to buy more Japanese stuff or will it cause Japanese people to buy more American stuff? And if you can't tell, the US and Japan will be the two countries that we're using, so the dollar and the yen will be our currencies for each of these examples. Okay, let's go. We'll start with a change in tastes. In this example, imagine that Japanese-made stuff gets more popular in the US, demand for the yen increases so that Americans can buy more Japanese stuff, and the supply of the dollar will also increase so that Americans can buy the yen they need to get the stuff. This is a good time to point out a couple of things. The yen appreciated, meaning that its value increased. It now takes more dollars to buy a yen after the shift than it did before, so the yen has become more valuable. The dollar has depreciated, so its value has decreased. It takes fewer yen to buy a dollar now than it did before. So when one currency appreciates, the other must depreciate. This is because they are priced in terms of each other. So a yen appreciation is the same as a dollar depreciation if those are only two currencies. Next up, changes in national income or real GDP. The currency of the country that has slower income or GDP growth appreciates, while the country with a faster income growth will see their currency depreciate. Sounds weird, I know, but this is a good chance to point out that there's nothing inherently good or bad about either an appreciation or a depreciation. Basically, if a country's income is rising faster, its people can afford to buy more stuff, including foreign-made stuff. So, for example, if US GDP is rising faster than Japan's, the demand for the yen will shift right, and the supply of the dollar will also shift right. So the yen will appreciate and the dollar will depreciate. Third is relative changes in the price level. The currency of the country with a lower inflation rate will appreciate, while the country with the higher inflation rate's currency depreciates. As an example, we'll say that the US has a higher inflation rate than Japan. What I want to show you this time is that there are two different equally correct ways to answer these scenarios. One way to do it is to recognize that Japanese people won't want to buy as many American goods, decreasing demand for the dollar, and decreasing the supply of the yen. 
This causes the dollar to depreciate and the yen to appreciate. But we could also say that Americans will want to buy more Japanese goods since they've become relatively cheaper, and this would increase demand for the yen and increase supply of the dollar. Either way we do it comes to the same conclusion. The dollar depreciates and the yen increases. Next up, changes in real interest rates. Remember, to buy financial assets like bonds from another currency, you first have to obtain that currency. So the currency of the country that has higher real interest rates will appreciate and the country with the lower real interest rates currency will depreciate. I wish we spent a little bit more time on this, but tariffs and quotas can also affect the FEM and values of currencies. An import tariff is a tax placed on foreign goods entering the country, and an import quota is a legal limit on how many goods from another country can be imported. Both of these policies will have the same effect, which is to reduce the demand for the foreign currency. So if only one country imposes these policies, we'd expect the domestic currency to appreciate and the foreign currency to depreciate. Okay, so if you're taking a test on just unit six, you're probably about set on the FEM. But if you're getting ready for a final exam on the AP test, fiscal and monetary policy are probably the things you'll see most often. And that can be a bit of a trap since you've learned those policies in the context of a closed economy all semester. But now we're opening it up. So those policies also impact the FEM. Happily, it's pretty simple. Expansionary policies, whether fiscal or monetary, lead to a currency depreciation by raising the price level and output. Contractionary policies, on the other hand, lead to a currency appreciation by decreasing the price level and output. Okay, let's take a moment to discuss how changes on the FEM affect net exports. When a currency appreciates, it becomes more valuable. As a result, foreign goods become relatively cheaper and domestic goods relatively more expensive to people in other countries. So following a currency appreciation, imports will increase and exports will decrease. And if we put this in terms of net exports instead, we can say that net exports decrease. This affects our ADS model, so a decrease in net exports causes the AD curve to shift to the left. When a currency depreciates, the opposite happens. Imports will decrease, exports will increase, so net exports increase, and this shifts the AD curve to the right on our ADS model. All right, the very last thing we need to discuss is real interest rates and international capital flows. We touched on this a little bit a few minutes ago, but we're gonna go into more detail now. Capital flows just mean that people can save their money and buy financial assets in their home country as well as in a foreign country. If two countries allow international capital flows, the principle is very simple. Money will flow to the country with a higher real interest rate because it offers savers a better return. Let's prove this using our loanable funds model. Assume that Canada and the US allow capital flows between their countries and that the real interest rate in Canada is 6% and it's only 2% in the US. This will lead to capital flowing from the US to Canada because American savers will be attracted to the higher rate of return their money can earn in Canada. So they'll save their money in Canadian institutions and buy Canadian bonds. On our model, we'll see the supply curve shift right in Canada as a result of the capital inflows. And we'll see the supply curve shift left in the US because of the capital outflows. We actually learned this back in Unit 4 when we were first introduced to the loanable funds model. Capital will continue flowing from the US to Canada as long as Canada's real interest rate remains higher. The capital flows drive down Canada's interest rate and raises the US's, and we'd expect both interest rates to converge somewhere in the middle, for example at 4%. Additionally, we can state that capital tends to flow from slowly growing economies to rapidly growing ones because the faster growing economies usually offer a higher real interest rate. And remember that changes in real interest rates affect the FEM like we just did a moment ago. So be careful when you're answering questions about this to make sure you're thinking about the right model. All right, well, congratulations, you've made it to the end. Until next time, this has been a La Money Production. Thanks again for watching, and since you made it all the way to the end, I'd really appreciate it if you could smash that like button and subscribe if you haven't. I'll be here for you when you're studying for your final or the AP exam, and if you're looking for a good study guide, make sure to check out Macro in 250 Words. The link is in the description, and I'll see you in another video.